Hi everybody, a gossip before bed. Now, if you haven't visited this channel before, you might think that this is what I normally do, but I don't. I do deep dives and well-researched sort of videos into books and news and opinion and everything. So you might want to check out something else on my playlist. This isn't what I normally do, but I decided to do something a little bit more relaxed, a little bit different, and this is just a gossip before bed bed. I have my cup of tea. I've got my nice vanilla scented candle and I'm rather relaxed. I did have my dog in here but I got rid of him because <laughs> he made me look like Lady C because for some reason he kept licking my face which he never does and I thought oh no I can't have that. I'm going to have a sip. Cheers. So this is going to be unedited and chatty and unashamedly gossipy so you know if you want mental stimulation I suggest you go off and watch one of my other videos <laughs> I will still do those a couple of times a week but I just thought it'd be fun maybe every Wednesday night to pop in and have a little bit of a goss before bed now for a lot of you I guess it'll be a goss in the morning as you wake up but it's night time here in Oz Wednesday night and I thought I'd just pop in for a bit of fun. I feel like I know a lot of you now, which is crazy because we've never met in real life, but I sort of have had conversation and exchanges of comments with people and I feel like I've got to know some of you now in the community. So I thought this would be fun. And if this goes well, we might actually expand it into a live chat every Wednesday night. Now, don't worry, I can't stand live chats either. I can't stand watching them they're so boring because people are always fiddling with all the technology and everything and say you know not saying anything and staring into the computer screen and looking stressed and all that it won't be like that because my sons are going to take care of all the tech side for me I can just sit here and blab on and um, I'll have my iPad to get at comments that you make and I'll just chat with you live so that'll be really exciting so what will we talk about tonight? Well, I thought I would mention uh, Megan at Kevin Costner's charity do at the polo field because what did you think of the outfit? Now, I actually thought that she looked quite chic. Where, when the camera went on her from a certain angle, I thought it looked really good. I thought it looked quite Audrey Hepburn, really. As long as it got the tight waist and the, you know, the cinched in part of the blanket, <laughs> it looked really good. But unfortunately, when the camera angle went round the back, it didn't look as good. It looked like a blanket. It looked like she was cold. And I know everyone else has mentioned this, and, you know, so I'm not bringing anything new to the conversation, but... I can't understand why she always wears such wintry clothes. And because a lot of the other people at the party had sort of shirts, light shirts on, and they looked quite, although Oprah Winfrey had quite a heavy jumper on. Did you notice? She had a big sort of woolly jumper on and it looked like leather pants. Couldn't get over Oprah's weight. She's quite thin now. Um, and I'm not sort of up with that. I think there was a bit of a scandal about that drug that can help you lose weight or something, wasn't there, to do with Oprah? I'm not up with that, so I can't inform you. But um, yes, she looks rather good. She looks quite fit and healthy and, you know, a healthy weight. And she looked quite good. What else about that? Oh, the mic. What did you think about that? Another sip. Did you think that was hilarious? <laughs> I did. Now, isn't that awful? Because I think it takes us back to the British Fashion Awards thing where we read that she wasn't expected to turn up and she sort of muscled her way in. And I can't remember who was supposed to be emceeing that night, but whoever was supposed to be emceeing that night got the short shift and Megan sort of muscled her way in and did the speech. And look... I actually wouldn't mind if she did speeches if she didn't keep making the same bloody speech. She makes the same speech every time. And she doesn't seem very, uh, 
informed. She doesn't seem like she's done her homework to me. I mean, you don't mind if someone makes a speech if they bring something sort of new or interesting to it or, you know, they you can tell they've done a bit of background on whatever they're talking about. But when she made that speech, even with Gloria Steinem that time, that was the gold dress one, wasn't it? And the Hertz rent car <laughs> exit and entry. Can't remember the name of the awards now. Women of something. Women of Substance, don't, don't quote me, I can't remember what the award was for. But that was the problem. It was like she'd sort of rehashed or recycled a speech rather than actually take note of what the event was about, take note of what the people at the event that were being awarded, what they'd achieved. Actually, I think that's why Prince William's Earthshot Awards actually succeed so well because the focus is firmly on the people getting the award. Like he'll emcee it and he'll throw the light on the people that have actually won an award. But the focus is on the actual Earthshot Prize. The focus is actually on the people that have won the prize and what they're achieving and what the wonderful inventions they've done. And they are wonderful inventions. There's something everyone can relate to. They make people's life better not worse. And I think that's why it works because the focus, other than the glam arrival of Catherine and William when they, you know, first arrived, which everyone wants a bit of glam. I mean, if we didn't have any glam, we probably wouldn't watch. So that's good. But then, you know, the focus for the rest of the night is on the people and their achievements and stuff. So there's that. There's the mic thing, which I, <laughs> I did laugh. But it, I don't have any contacts in Hollywood. I know every other royal YouTuber has said, well, I got the inside goss that Kevin Costner, and they probably do have the inside goss and they probably do have people that they know. I don't know anybody at all. But like you, I think I was able to sort of discern that Kevin Costner doesn't like Meghan Markle. You could pick it up in the body language because whenever he was with her, he looked grumpy and trying not to catch her eye and looking quite, quite, maybe he just has a really grumpy resting face like Ben Affleck, but he doesn't normally. He seems quite a nice man. I, I like Kevin Costner. But when he was standing next to Harry, he looked quite animated. He sort of had a half crooked sort of smile <laughs> when he was standing next to Harry. And I think the really hilarious thing is they wouldn't let her get the microphone. <laughs> You weren't going to let that go, baby. It's like the woman who was emceeing had been instructed not to hand the microphone to Meghan Markle. But it was offered to Harry later, which is hilarious. So I think that Meghan and Harry might have an arrangement where she says, oh, I'll do the thank you and the welcome and you give the award to Kevin. And that would probably suit Harry because Harry hates making speeches. But I think the trouble is I don't think it's just that he hates making speeches now. I think he's lost a lot of confidence and I think he's been relegated to almost like, the you know, on those game shows where the girls turn around the letters and <laughs> point to the letters or gee, he's doing deal or no deal. He's doing Megan's old job. He's doing the presenting and she's doing the sort of emceeing and the official royal role. Um, and actually, it's interesting. In Angela Levin's book about Harry, um, she takes note of that because she followed them sort of after they became engaged and they did that six-month tour of the UK. And she made a point of saying that over time she realised that Harry went from being the star to relegated to the one who opened the curtain on the plaque while Megan held forth on the microphone. And like I said, he that may be the way he wants it to be. Who knows? But if he didn't have any choice in the matter, that is now firmly his place. Now, I'm going to look up my iPad and have a look at some of the comments that have been on the last few videos that I've made because there's been some really good ones. And I thought it would be fun to read out a comment but actually, you know, chat back if I can. I'll try and find some controversial ones so that it's interesting. Oh, an ad just played while I get my comments up.
Okay, so um, Sassy T1545 says, Blurred boundaries were a common theme in Diana's life. A more disturbing example than Paul Burrell was her lack of boundaries with William, treating him like her confidant and her therapist instead of her child. Hmm. Yeah, that has been documented, um, not necessarily by people that are, you know, admire Diana, mind you. So I guess we could take it with a grain of salt. But then again, maybe she wasn't using William. I'll, I'll just play devil's, devil's advocate. I'll take the other side of some comments, okay? Maybe she wasn't actually burdening William with it as much as trying to explain her position. I think that happens a lot with divorced couples with kids where they're trying to clarify their position or trying to um, make themselves look good in the eyes of their child because they're aware that maybe uh, what they're being spun on the other side isn't very flattering. Now, I don't know, and I would imagine that Diana would have felt very threatened because William was going to lunch every Sunday with Granny and Prince Philip. And, I mean, I don't think the Queen and Prince Philip would even bring her up. I don't think that they would ever burden a child by being mean about their mum. But, you know, I could imagine that Diana, who was feeling paranoid, was feeling threatened, was feeling vulnerable, was feeling on the outer that maybe she was just trying to explain herself and inadvertently may, might have burdened her child. I know all the tears and all that sort of thing would burden any child, but, you know, if you've got a mum with men suffering mental health issues, well, you're going to get those tears and tantrums and high emotion and kids all over the world go through that, you know, including mine. No, <laughs> I just said that. I try to avoid the tears and tantrums if I can. Do them in the shower. That's the best place. Okay, next comment. Um, DY7361 says, I'm not surprised to hear this at all. On one hand, Diana was desperate for love and companionship because of her broken marriage and also the family she came from. Yes, that's true. I mean, she had an awful childhood. She really had an awful, awful childhood. And I feel so deep for, deeply for her mother. Now I've read more into it. And all of you know the story, don't you? That her own mother testified against her so that the children actually went to Earl Spencer rather than in custody of Diana's mum, Frances Shan Kidd, because she'd run off with, I think it's Peter Shan Kidd. And, yes, so fancy your own mother testifying against you in court. Now, there was actually a good reason for that, although I can't imagine any justification for a mother testifying against her own daughter, can you? But evidently, this is before um, Johnny Spencer had actually inherited and become became Earl Spencer because his dad was still alive when all this was going on. So they weren't living at Althorpe. They were living at Park House, which was in the grounds of either Sandringham or Windsor. I think it's Sandringham. I've probably got that wrong. Sorry, I didn't look it up. I didn't know I was going to talk about this. And so they were in a house that they were renting, you know, a grace and favour sort of beautiful mansion that was allowed to them by the royal family with the understanding that they knew that Johnny Spencer was going to inherit, you know, the grand stately home in due course. So they stayed in this park house and I'm pretty sure it is in the grounds of Sandringham and that's how they, uh, Diana used to play with Andrew and that when he was little because they were about the same age. So it the, sort of it said that Ruth Fomoy was actually trying to ensure that the kids were kept at Park House because she was terrified that if her daughter got custody that she would actually whisk them off to Australia or whisk them off to Argentina or whisk them off somewhere. No, Argentina was Fergie's mum, wasn't it? But whisk them away and that they would lose all contact and context within society and, you know, I, I guess in relation to the royal family. So that was her true fear was that lack of connection with the royals 
if her daughter got custody. Okay, let's read another one. Um, so this is F F Staffia Kozakisu. I'm sorry, it was extremely long. I'll try and say it properly. Estathia Kozitsudu. I think that's right. I find the lack of boundaries in Diana's behaviour appalling. It doesn't surprise me. However, she was insecure, unstable. However, to work without set hours, I find it very wrong. The man had a family, for God's sake. Yes, yes. That was really startling to me. That's why I made the video. For those who haven't seen it yet, um, it's a video that I did called Blurred Boundaries. And it was about, it was from Burrell, Paul Burrell's perspective. And I was bringing up the fact that Paul Burrell said that he found it really hard when he moved from Highgrove, where he was the butler, and he went to uh, Diana at KP, that it was very casual all of a sudden. And he was a bit freaked out because he was used to saying your Royal Highness and keeping everything formal and having set roles. And Diana really didn't give him clear working hours. And that was what the video is about. And I said other things as well, if you want to check it out. But that's what this comment's about, the fact that there was no set work hours. And often it was found that um, he'd be sitting down, for example, to have dinner with his family and Diana would ring and he'd have to run back. And Have you ever had a situation like that where you've been in the workplace and it's been blurred boundaries and people have sort of overstepped the mark? I have story time. I was working in a bookstore. Now, I've worked in several bookstores throughout my life when I was young, and this one was a big sort of chain. And I was sort of the, like, I came in as a senior sort of retail assistant, but I became much more than that. But that's where it was sort of my entry level position. And the boss that gave me the job took a shining to me. And that was fine, you know, it's quite helpful that your boss likes you. But I found it really hard because when I had to go into the back storeroom and sort of unpack these huge pallets of books and do admin sort of work and everything with her, she used to tell me overly intimate things about her life, like her love life. And um, now the first thing you're going to think is, oh, you know, was she gay and was she... <laughs> trying to seduce you. No, she wasn't gay. She was heterosexual and she was not interested in me in that way, but she was just, I think, maybe, you know, looking for a bestie. So she used to tell me these rather intimate things and everything. And it used to get a little bit embarrassing because it was too much information too soon, but I just stayed friendly and that's fine. That's fine. Until she started ringing me at home. Now, that would have been fine if we had have exchanged phone numbers and it had been agreed that we were becoming friends outside work. And then if she wanted to ring me, well, that's fine. You know, that's fine. But she rang. We hadn't exchanged numbers. She'd got my number off my work file and she started ringing me at home. And it, she'd ring me on my day off. And anyone who knows, I mean, it was a fairly hard job and I'd worked long hours and so when I got a day off, I just wanted to forget about the place and I just wanted to see my husband if he had a day off I wanted, or I wanted to see one of my, you know, real girlfriends in real life or, you know, or just wanted to chill and watch Netflix or something, you know. And she would ring and I didn't have an answering machine and it was on the landline back in those days, so dumb me, you know, I'd pick up. And, you know, I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't screen. I couldn't screen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was really awkward because I sort of want to get off the phone, but she'd be on for a chat. And I noticed that she would often roster my days off with her days off. So then it would turn into, oh, what are you doing on your day off? And then I'd sort of have to frantically make up something that I was busy because I knew the next thing would be, oh, do you want to meet up and go shopping and have lunch or something? And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to because I saw her all week. And so, you know, you know, you know. Well, that's fine. But then she started ringing me at night. She started ringing me when she couldn't sleep. And then the big one was she rang me when her cat was sick and I ended up having to go out in the middle of the night, pick her and her cat up 
and take them to the emergency vet. Another sip. So it was really awkward. So after a while, and it got it got to the point where I can't even remember how I said it, but I think I said it in a friendly way that, you know, I don't even know how I said it. I think I said it very well, but I think I got across the fact, please stop ringing me on my days off, which let's face it would have been a rebuff. I tried not to make it like a rebuff. And she, the next sort of day that I was on roster with her, she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't look at me. She wouldn't say hello. I had to spend the whole day. Oh, it was awful. It was just awful. I had to spend the whole day with her not looking at me, not talking to me, not answering me if I asked her a question. It was a nightmare. And that's an example of blurred boundaries. So when I read this in Paul Burrell's book, I, I just, it, it brought up the same feelings for me. And so that was sort of the idea for the video. Now, finally, just the end of this chat, um, I'll bring up about the Russell Brand thing. Don't worry, nothing too heavy, nothing political, nothing like that. But I was surprised at the strength of feeling in the comments. Now, I have taken down the animal abuse one because I don't feel like I was balanced enough. So I took that down. But I left up the trauma childhood one because that refers to it. But I think it also balances it with the trauma he had in his childhood. And like I said, not making excuses. But I was just trying to balance my review of the book. And I think that was a better video. I was quite proud of that one. So I left that up, okay, because it was more impartial. It told all sides. It hinted on the animal abuse sort of pattern of behaviour, but it didn't sort of really, you know, get into the nitty gritty. So I quite like that video. But I had to think about it because a lot of people were so emotional and so upset. And I thought, what is it? What is it? You know, it's almost like he's this guy that we that we have to worship. And I, I can't work it out because he's just a guy. And so I went and had a look and I looked back at some of the videos that he made during the pandemic and I can see why people got very, very connected to him during the pandemic. Because he made some quite nice videos and he made yoga videos and he made a video just moving because I'm getting dead leg. Um, he made videos with, uh, I think it's yoga with Adrienne and I love her videos. She's the yoga lady that's got a dog and it, she's brilliant. And she was, she became huge over the pandemic because everybody wanted to, you know, do yoga at home and learn something new. And Russell Brand sort of did a live stream with her where they're both doing yoga and it was quite cute and he was quite charming, he was quite fun. And I can see, and there was none of these big political rants or anything, it was just a nice feel-good sort of video. And I could see how people did sort of succumb to his charm because it would have been quite comforting, I imagine, if you had been in lockdown or something, it would have been quite comforting to see this video. So then I saw it sort of another side. And then I realised that I think the main fear people have is they're going to lose an alternative voice. A lot of people want a very strong alternative political and issue-based voice. So I thought if you want an alternative uh, voice regarding health, and I have to be careful in the way I phrase this, and really I'm not... Um, really sort of that alternative or anything. But this uh, doctor, Dr. John Campbell, you might have heard of his YouTube channel. He is an alternative health voice, particularly in things around the pandemic, if you get my meaning. Now, I'm not advocating any conspiracy theories or anything because he's a real doctor and he, he draws on real data, government issued data, um, health data from the major pharmaceutical companies, things like that. And he presents this data, but more importantly, he interprets the data. And he gives you sort of a real, the real story about it. So that's Dr. John Campbell. If you want to check out his YouTube channel, he would provide a similar service to you as I would imagine Russell Brand performs for you. 
but it, like I said, it's all backed up by the fact that he's fully qualified, definitely an alternative voice, definitely challenging the status quo, but he is fully qualified. And like I said, everything he says is verifiable and can be backed up with facts. And that's the reason why his YouTube channel too does not get affected because he is, like I said, presenting data that is readily available in the public domain. But what is interesting is his interpretation based on his medical experience, his interpretation of that data. So you might want to check him out. And if you're a big Russell Brand fan and you're scared about a voice being silenced, that might be someone that you might want to check out. Um, and the other thing is everybody was really upset about the fact that that UK government MP, I forget her name, actually sent a letter asking for him to be demonetized on Rumble. I think it was under the Surveillance Act or the Trust Act or the or the Online Safety Act. Again, this video isn't researched. I'm just sitting chatting. And people were really, you know, understandably threatened by that because they're saying, well, if you have, forget it's Russell Brand, if you have Joe Bloggs, and if Joe Bloggs is facing allegations from, you know, accusers, can you actually go in and take away Joe Bloggs' livelihood or whatever before actual charges have been laid and before they've been tested in court? And people are understandably like, whoa, like, you know, who decides this before it's been tested in court? And I totally agree with that. And then there's the other side where people said to me in the comments, yes, but if you're in a corporate job and you have allegations of a sexual nature against you, you will be suspended without pay until these are looked into. And that's a valid point, except YouTube and by extension Rumble, say if they demonetize, which they're not going to, um, they wouldn't be looking into the charges though. You see, it's not like a corporate organization is looking into the charges and then they file their report and if they find any criminal behavior, they refer it to the police. It's a completely different thing because YouTube wouldn't be looking into it. So yeah, so that's really interesting and I can really see that concern and I can really see that side of the debate D despite the fact I've made it very clear I'm not a fan of him I can see that side I can see the free speech side of the debate that particular side mind you just finishing up I was astounded um like I said in the comments that a lot of, now not just your run-of-the-mill fan, they were prepared to discuss the issues and just disagree. That's fine. It was very interesting, actually. But really sort of rabid fans, <laughs> the ones that are full on, they do not, they, would, they didn't want me to be able to say anything. They, they didn't want me to be able to give an opinion about his book. They didn't want me to be able to give an opinion about him if it was negative. I would have been allowed to talk about the book if I had been entirely positive about him. So talk about shutting down free speech. It, it was astonishing to me that you can have people that are so <laughs> fervent about advocating for free speech yet they won't let others have an opinion. And I wasn't even talking about the allegations. I was talking about his childhood. I was talking about something completely unrelated. So I didn't even mention the, the current allegations. So I think you've got to watch that. If you're going to be an advocate for free speech, you have to allow people to question and criticise even someone you really love and like. You've got to let them criticise and question because that's all part of it. Otherwise, it's sort of like authoritarianism, but in another way, on the other side. So anyway, that's my two cents for what it's worth. Let me know if you like me doing these informal chats. Like I said, if you do like them, I think I'll do them every Wednesday night. Um, if you're new to this channel, please check out my other videos because they're, like I said, well-researched sort of stories that are cohesive and not a ramble like this video. And if you do like this and you do like it, give it a thumbs up 
and let me know in the comments if you like having a chat every Wednesday. And like I said, if you really like it, we'll turn it into a live stream, not a boring live stream, but a, you know, a fairly pacey, chatty one. And yeah, just let me know what you think. And I'll see you again. Now, tomorrow night is the premiere of uh, the sort of part two of the story I told the other day, but this gets really juicy. It's about the Diana Stair story and it's about all the different versions of that story. And I really looked into it and it's really interesting. And I did a bit of a timeline. So you might want to catch that. That's at 9.45 p.m. my time tomorrow night. So a premiere means that it is a recorded video, but there's live chat. And we do chat quite vigorously in the live chat while the premiere is going on. And then everybody has to watch it again because <laughs> they miss most of it. So let me know what you think. And I'll see you again next Wednesday for a casual gossip before bed. Bye.